You risked your life so we could experience freedom. You left your family so we could be with ours. You sacrificed it all for the greater good. You have stood up so that we can have freedom and liberty. You are the heroes of our nation. You have served our country honorably, and we thank you for your sacrifice. Hey there, I'm Joey Santos, the online pastor here at Christ Church. Welcome to CC Life Plus. Thank you so much for checking us out. Listen, you probably saw a lot of content here, right? For kids, adults, uh, music, podcasts. That's why we created this for you. So listen, go ahead, fill out this form right here because we created this with you in mind so we can connect. It's all about engagement. So we want to talk with you. We want to engage with you. We want to discover about new ways that we can grow together in Christ through technology. And I believe 
turtle. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I Well, hey, good morning, Church of the Bar. Brad Wilson here. Excited to be with you today and excited as we start a new series called Encounters. And what this series is about is we're going to look at four encounters that Jesus has with people in the Gospels and how these encounters can impact us today. You know, the Bible is full of stories in the Old Testament and New Testament where regular, everyday, normal people encounter God. And what we see in these encounters is how God uses these people, just like you and me, how he speaks to people like you and me, and how these encounters not only change their lives, but change the lives of so many other people. You see, when we read the, the Gospels, one of the unique things that we're able to witness is how Jesus interacts with people, how he builds relationships, how he talks with people, how he walks with people, how he works in people's lives. And these stories that we see, these encounters that we read about, are, are they're, they're more than just stories and encounters for us to, uh, to learn something about, for us to, to look at and say, man, that's, that's pretty cool, that's, that's pretty fascinating. I believe that these encounters, these stories, go a, a long way in helping to shape and define our faith. They teach us how Jesus views us and how he wants to interact with us. The Bible is more than just stories and a, a historical document that shows us how God interacted with people throughout history. The Bible is a reminder that the God that interacted in history with his people still interacts with his people today, and that's you and me. And so when we read stories in the Bible, like when God led his people out of Egypt, and they, they, they had a barricade, they got to the, the, the sea. And they, didn't, they looked back and they saw the Egyptian army come. And they looked in front of them and they saw this, this sea, this body of water. And we read this story about how God did the impossible and parted the sea so his people could go through it and escape the army that was chasing them. That's a story that's not only a, a great reminder of what God did in Scripture, but it's a reminder for us today that there are going to be times in our life where we're faced with the impossible and there's no direction to go, and God will, will part the sea in our life to allow us to go through. We read about stories and encounters when the fiery furnace with um, when God's people, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're, they're put in the furnace. And they look in the furnace, and they're like, wait a minute, there's, there's three guys thrown in there, but there's four in the furnace. And it's a reminder that when we face our own fiery furnaces of life, that, that God doesn't abandon us, but He's right there with us. And when we see these encounters over the next four weeks in, in the Gospels that, and that Jesus encounters with people, it's a reminder that we may at times feel alone. We may at times have questions. We may at times wonder what God's doing. But what these encounters are going to remind us is that Jesus wants to interact with us. Jesus wants to be involved in our lives. In fact, he is involved in our lives. But the key for us is making sure we, we realize that or we see that. See, sometimes we miss out on what God is doing in our lives. We miss out on these encounters because uh, maybe we're, we're not seeing things clearly or maybe um, we're, we're, we don't completely understand how God engages with us. And so over these next four weeks, I want to share with you some, some of these stories. 
And I want to help hopefully open our eyes to see the ways, maybe the methods, maybe the times where God interacts on us, to see those encounters that, that we can be a part of, and not only to see how God in, encounters and interacts with us, but to, to help us understand and get a better idea of how we can encounter and interact with other people. And so we're going to start today with uh, our first question, and it's speaking of encounters. You know, this past week, I had an, an interesting encounter myself, but it wasn't with a person. It was with Brussels sprouts. 42 years old, never had Brussels sprouts in my entire life. And those things are interesting things. They, they look like little like uh, heads of, of lettuce, and I've heard horror stories about them, but we got together with some friends, and these things were made in an air fryer, which really confused me because I think of an air fryer, you put mozzarella sticks, tater tots, um, chicken nuggets, uh, maybe you'll throw in some. I, I put chicken in there, but never thought about vegetables, in particular Brussels sprouts, but my first encounter with them wasn't bad. They were better than I anticipated, better than I thought. But it was still kind of weird thinking that I've, I'm going to eat these Brussels sprouts. And so I want you to think about an encounter you've had. Maybe it's with a person, maybe it's food, maybe it's something else. But what's the weirdest encounter you've ever had. Now think about that. When you get in your groups, what is the weirdest, the strangest, maybe it was good, maybe it was bad, but what's the weirdest encounter you've ever had? Take some time, talk about this, and then we'll be back and we're going to jump into the Bible today.
All right. Well, welcome back. And uh, I'm sure that you had some very interesting stories to talk about there. But we're going to begin our story. And our first encounter in this series is going to be an encounter that Jesus has with Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel, you may be like, well, who's Nathaniel? Nathaniel is one of the disciples. Uh, sometimes he, he's known to a lot of people as Bartholomew. But we read his story starting in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 43. And let's read through that as we jump in today. Verse 43 says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, and finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Now we read about Philip, and Philip's in this story, but he's not our focus today. So he finds Philip, he says, Follow me, Philip, and Philip jumps on board. Verse 44 says, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so here's this encounter. And we see that Jesus meets Philip. He says, Philip, follow me. Philip jumps on board. Then Philip goes and finds his friend Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. We found the one Moses and the prophets that they talked about. But we see this kind of interaction and Nathaniel doubts it at first. Then he has this encounter with Jesus. And so a, a big takeaway for us is we're, we're moving forward today. And this is kind of the idea um, for you and for me today is is Jesus saying, follow me and, and you will see. Follow me and you're going to see greater things than, than you've ever seen in your life. Follow me and you're going to see what I can do in your life, what I'm going to do in other people's lives. And so uh, a takeaway, if you're writing this down today, is we talk about these encounters, is Jesus, not only to, to Philip, not only to Nathaniel, but Jesus saying to you and me today, guys, follow me. Trust me, pursue me, come along with me and see what I'm going to do in your life and through your life. Like in this point in, in the story of Jesus, he's putting together his group of disciples. We know he has 12 disciples. Nathaniel is one of the disciples. Now, we don't hear a lot about him. He, he doesn't play as significant of a role in the Bible as, as someone like Peter or John would, but Nathaniel is still a part of the 12. We know from his story that he's, he's up to date, he's, he's educated, he has an understanding of the scriptures. That's why Philip says to him, Nathaniel, we found the guy that Moses wrote about in the law and whom the prophets also wrote about, Jesus. We found the Messiah. So they're, they're talking and, and it gives us a clue that they're a little more educated than maybe some of the other disciples. Now Philip's bought in. But Nathaniel, he's, as we see as we're working through the story, initially he isn't bought in. And what's the reason for that? Well, it wasn't that, that Philip was a bad guy. The, the, the Bible says that he had a pure heart, that he had a real love for God. He had a genuine desire to see the Messiah. And you're like, oh, how do we know that? We, well, we know that by the interaction that Philip and Nathaniel have. We also know that when Jesus sees Nathaniel, he says, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. That's important for us. The Bible tells us in Psalm chapter 32 that blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. So Jesus says about Nathaniel, he says, there's no deceit in this man. He's a good man. Didn't mean he was sinless. It just meant that he was a good guy. He, he, he was a guy that Jesus wanted to be a part of his disciples. But as we see in this story, Nathaniel has a, if you want to use a stumbling block, an obstacle, he has something in the way of allowing him initially to follow Jesus. Remember, Jesus says, follow me, right? And you will see, follow me. 
That's what he wants. And Nathaniel, though, he's got a barricade. He's got something he has to work past. And the truth is, is that for you, for me, most if not all of us have a challenge. We have something that, uh, an impediment in allowing us to really commit to following God. There's something that, that, that in our life, something that will pop up from time to time. There's something that we wrestle with that keeps us from really following Jesus the way he wants us to. See, I don't think it's a matter of whether we, we like Jesus or not. A lot of people, we like Jesus. We're interested in Jesus. We love what he offers, but there is still that one thing that keeps us from really following him, that keeps us from really committing to him we see in the story here from nathaniel it was his prejudice against jesus you can say wait a minute how are you, how can you say that well let's go back to verse 46 verse 46 says we, we see nathaniel's like nazareth can anything good come from there nathaniel asked to which philip replies come and see see nathaniel struggled with the fact that jesus was from nazareth in his mind, there was nothing good that would come from Nazareth. And it just wasn't a, a thought that just happened to Nathaniel. To him and others during this time period, Nazareth was a nothing town. Like, there was nothing good in Nazareth. There's nothing good that would come from Nazareth. It, it wasn't worth mentioning or talking about. We know that Nazareth was, was in the, the hill country of Galilee, but it's never mentioned in the Old Testament it's never mentioned in the Jewish Talmud, it, or, nor even any pagan writings during this time period. No one talked about Nazareth. In fact, the Judeans looked down on all Galileans. So if you're from Galilee, the Judeans will look down upon you. There's a character that we see in the Gospel of John named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is an interesting character because um, he was a part of the Sanhedrin, and he was a respected religious leader. But he was curious about Jesus. We read a little bit about Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And later on in John chapter 7, when the Sanhedrin's going after Jesus, Nicodemus is, is he's trying to figure out this Jesus dynamic. He kind of is trying to caution them on a step they wanted to take. And the response to Nicodemus from the, the rest of the religious leaders, we see in John chapter 7, was they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that the prophet or that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Now, a better translation would be the prophet or the Messiah does not come from Galilee. The Judeans, as Nicodemus is trying to stick up and defend Jesus here, the Judeans who looked down on all Galileans said, Nicodemus, are you a Galilean? Because we know that nothing good, nothing of value, there's no way that that the Messiah that God is sending would come from Galilee. And what's even crazier is not only the Judeans look down on all Galileans, Galileans look down on the Nazarenes. So the fact that Jesus was from Nazareth in Galilee, a lot of people we see here with Nathaniel is like, there's no way the Messiah would come from here. See, Nathaniel was prejudiced against Jesus. He had a prejudice. And let's define it so we're on the same page here. When we talk about a prejudice, we're talking about a preconceived judgment or opinion. And what's interesting about this is that you and I, whether we want to admit it or not, we, we, we have prejudices. We have them about people. And you think a preconceived judgment or opinion. For some of us, we, when we see people, we make a quick judgment or we have a, a, a judgment or opinion on them based, at how they're, based on how they're dressed. Sometimes we, we see a, a car someone's driving, and if it's a nice car, we'll think differently about a person than if it's a car that, you know, the bumper's kind of hanging off, and, and one of the tires looks really low, and, um, you know, there's a, there's a dent on the car. If, if we look at a, a car that's someone that's driving a brand new Tesla and someone that's driving a car that's pretty beat up, we will have a preconceived judgment or opinion on these people. We do it with people, how people dress. We do it with how, where people work or, or where they live or the education they have. It's, it, we, we do that with people, but it's not just with people. We have uh, preconceived judgments or opinions about places. You know, 
the state was abuzz uh, a couple Mondays ago for the Battle of Ohio, Cleveland versus Cincinnati. And if you're a Browns fan, you don't like Bengals fans. If you're a Bengals fan, you don't like Browns fan. If you're someone that's like, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not against either teams, Cleveland fans or Cincinnati fans will tell you, man, pick a side. I remember years ago, Sam Weich made the comment when, when fans were throwing stuff in the field, he says, you know, basically implying, he's like, hey, Cincinnati fans, stop it. You're not from Cleveland, right? There's these, there's these prejudices that people have, these preconceived ideas or judgments. And for some of you in Ohio, you're like, well, forget the teams in Ohio. You know, you think, man, you go up 75 to Detroit, and some of you are like, man, Detroit, you're even worse than everyone else. We have preconceived ideas, judgments, opinions about people. We have them about places. Truth is, we have them about Jesus. See, a lot of us don't think we're good enough. A lot of us don't think that, that, that other people are good enough to receive what Jesus offers. A lot of times, the activity we do, a lot of times that are this, this preconceived opinion that I'm not good enough for what Jesus offers causes us to, to try to earn that love, to earn that favor. Some of us have this preconceived opinion that Jesus doesn't really care about us. We may be in a difficult situation, a difficult circumstance, and we feel all alone. We feel like, he doesn't really care about me. Sometimes I think we, we have this preconceived judgment or opinion that we don't think that God's able. Like we read stories in the Bible and we'll see, well, he interacted here, he intervened here, but why doesn't God do that for me? We carry these things with us. This brings us to our second question today. And I want you to think about this, what we're talking about, these preconceived judgments or opinions. And when you get in with your groups, what's a preconceived judgment or opinion either you've had about God or you may have about God? Take some time, get together, I'll talk about this question, and we'll be back to continue on.
All right, guys, welcome back. And let's keep moving, right? Because even in the midst of our prejudices, prejudices we have with Jesus, he says, follow me, and you will see. Like we see that with Nathaniel. Go back to verse 47. It says, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel asked, how do you know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. See, there's no doubt Jesus knew that Nathaniel, when he heard about him, had this preconceived opinion, this preconceived judgment that there's no way that this guy is who they think he is. But Jesus wasn't going to allow the prejudice that Nathaniel had to keep him from calling him, asking him to follow him. His, Nathaniel's skepticism, his prejudice of Jesus, interestingly enough, though, all went out the window when he finally encountered Jesus. Verse 49 says that he declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And this is why this encounters series that we're talking about is so important for us. Because we see here with Jesus, and Nathaniel had all these ideas. He had these preconceived judgments, these preconceived opinions. But when he met Jesus, when he encountered him, it changed in that instance. And I love Jesus' response to what Nathaniel said. He says, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. See, what Jesus is telling him here, he's saying, Nathaniel, you haven't seen anything yet. You think it's amazing because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. And before Philip talked to you, before Philip told you, hey, well, you got to go meet this guy. I, I, I saw you under the fig tree, and you think that's phenomenal. But if you think that's great, guy, I, I have news for you. You're going to see even bigger and better things than that. You're going to have a front row seat to the unbelievable. And when you bring that back to you and me, sometimes we forget that. See, sometimes the skepticism, sometimes the, the preconceived judgments, the preconceived opinions we have about Jesus, we have about God, exist, and we hold on to them and we have them because we've never really encountered Jesus. Like we've heard about him. We've had other people invite us to, hey, why don't you come experience him? Why don't you come know but when we don't have those encounters, we create the ability, we, we create kind of the atmosphere in our life for us to continue to think these things, to doubt these things. But what's so important, what we see here today, is the only person that's keeping you from encountering Jesus in a way that can change your life is you. You're the only person that's, that's it's allowing that to happen. See, if Nathaniel would have never if Nathaniel would have never taken that step, never would have went with Philip to encounter Jesus, if he would have never taken that step, if he would have stayed away and said, I, I'm not going to do this, he would have missed out on, on this life-changing encounter, and, and this encounter would change the rest of his life. And for some of us, I can't help but think that we are missing out on a, a change in our lives we are missing out on some amazing things that God wants us to witness, that God wants us to see, that God wants us to be a part of, because we're not encountering Jesus. And like I said, it's not on Jesus' end, it's on our end. And often it's based on a preconceived judgment, it's based on a preconceived opinion. See, for many people, we think, going back, we, we think, well, I, I'm not good enough, or... I don't know enough, or I've made too many mistakes, or there's no way God would use me, or, or I, I, I don't think Jesus really cares about me. And we allow these preconceived opinions, these preconceived ideas to keep us from encountering the one that, as he says here, if you follow me, you're going to see some amazing things. You're going to be a part of some amazing things. And your life is going to be different. It's going to be changed and so what i love about this story is even though nathaniel had his doubts even though nathaniel had his questions jesus didn't give up on nathaniel just like he doesn't give up on you and me so here's our third question today i want you to think about this 
we know from the story that Jesus doesn't give up on Nathaniel. So why? Why do you think Jesus didn't give up on Nathaniel? Take a few minutes, talk about this, and we'll be back uh, to wrap things up today.
All right, Church of the Bar, we are back. We have we have one more question left today, not two, one question left. And so let's move this to us. So what about us? What can we take away from this encounter? Well, there's two things we see from this encounter. The first one is God values commitment over qualifications. God values commitment over qualification. You may say, well, what do you mean? Let's read from 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. It says, but God shows the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God shows the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God shows the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. What this tells us is that in the church, in God's kingdom, which we all want to be a part of, there should be no boasting, no bragging, no comparison because no one is qualified. See, sometimes we lose track of it and we compare our qualifications to someone else. Sometimes we do it from a, more of a bragging side. For some of us, like I said, we, we look and we're like, man, there's no way God would love me because I'm, I'm underqualified. But what this verse reminds us of is that God doesn't look at us and God's not looking for what we often look for. Right? We, a lot of times in, in, in our professional lives, we focus on the resume. We focus on the qualifications. We focus on what someone brings to the table. And we use someone's education. We use someone's wealth. We use someone's experience. We use someone's look. We use someone's abilities. And we determine value there. And we sometimes take that and we transfer that into our relationship with God. But what the Bible tells us here is God doesn't look at that at all. God's looking for someone that's committed to him. God just wants to know, will you follow me? And if you say yes, guess what? You're qualified. Are you committed or not? Are you going to follow him? That's what he's looking for. The second thing is, we can witness greatness. I love this. Jesus said in verse 50, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than that. See, Jesus connected the dots here for Nathaniel. And once he connected the dots, he told Nathaniel, Nathaniel, you've been waiting for the Messiah. And now he's here. And all those things you've dreamed about, all those things you thought, man, the Messiah is going to do this and this and this. He said, you're going to get a front row seat to witness that. You're going to see what was prophesied play out in front of your eyes. And what's amazing, it's no different today. I want you to, to, to hear this. What he's telling Nathaniel and what Nathaniel is going to witness, we get to witness the same thing today. See, we sometimes forget that we are eyewitnesses to the restoration of creation to the Creator. We get to witness God working in people's life. You, you've had the, the amazing ability. You've seen people baptized down, you just, you know, you go off from where you're at, down, you've seen people baptized in the river. And sometimes we think, oh man, the baptism is pretty cool. It's more than pretty cool. In those moments, you've seen people, you, you've seen their eternity written. You've seen their eternity changed. When they've made that decision to put their faith in Jesus to be baptized, you've not only seen people go under the water and come out, you've seen them get wet, you've seen their eternities change. You, you, you've seen a, uh, them being restored to the Creator. We have this unique ability that when we serve people, when we're generous to people, when we share Jesus with people, we see someone's, not just their life here and now change, but we see the rest of their lives. We see the eternity change for the good. We get to be a part of that. We get to do that. We, we get to, to witness Jesus working through us. We, we get to witness Jesus doing uh, unbelievable things in people's lives. We get to see him break the strongholds of sin and to bring freedom into people's lives. That's what we get to be a part of when we choose to follow Him. So this brings us to our last question today. We talked about this idea, follow me and you'll see. Jesus says, follow me and you're going to see greater things than you've ever seen in your life. He says, follow me and, and you think you've seen some unbelievable things. You think you've seen some huge wins, some, some, some huge wins in the kingdom. If you follow me, and commit to me, and, and you go with me, you are going to experience and see some things that you never thought you'd see. 
And that was true then, it's true today, it's gonna be true tomorrow. So question for today is, is what is your big takeaway from this encounter with Jesus today? Right? What's your big takeaway today? What is that one thing that you've grabbed a hold of or that's, that's kind of spinning in your brain a little bit? What's the big takeaway you have from this encounter with Jesus today? Take a few minutes, talk about this. Last question, we'll be back to close things up and pray for you.
All right, Church of the Bar, I am excited uh, about these next few weeks as we work through this Encounters series. And um, my prayer for this series is that whether you're with us online, whether you're with us at Church of the Bar, whether you're with us up here in person at the Mason campus, my prayer is going to be that all of us over this month will, will not only learn something from these encounters, but that what we take from these encounters, that we'll have the opportunity, we'll see the ability for us to encounter God on a daily basis. And when we see that, and like we talked about today, when we follow Him, I have no doubt in my mind that we're going to see God do some amazing things in our life, in, in, in the lives of the people in our family, in the lives of our friends, and in, in, in our community. But like I said, what God is looking for, what Jesus is asking today, is He's asking for you to follow Him. He's asking for you to trust Him. And so as we wrap things up, I just want to encourage you that if, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this today, and you're sitting there thinking, I need to take that step. Just as Jesus asked Philip, just as he asked Nathaniel to follow him, I need to take that step and begin following him today. If that's you, if that's you, talk. Talk to your leaders at Church of the Bar. Talk to Joey. Talk to Chad. I say, hey, what, what does this look like? What's it look like to follow him? I, I want more information. I want to take that step today. Trust me, you will never, of all the decisions you can make, the decision to follow Jesus, to follow him and to see what he's going to do in your life and through your life, you will never regret that decision. And so if that's on your heart today, if that's in your mind today, uh, I want to encourage you to act on it. Let me pray for us today, and then we're going to wrap things up and I'll turn things back over uh, to the team down there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, the reminder of, of just that you want to encounter us. And Father, uh, what's a great reminder for us today is uh, you're, you're not looking at our qualifications. You don't look at us and say, man, you're, you're, you're overqualified or you're underqualified. You just look to us and you invite us to follow you, to be in relationship with you. And you put the ball in our court. And we can either choose to accept that offer and follow you, or we can choose to continue to, to do what we think is best. And Father, my prayer today is that if there's people um, at Church of the Bar today that need to take you up on your offer and begin to follow you, that they'll have the courage uh, to make that decision of the courage to take those steps to begin to follow you. Father, we're excited about what you're going to do over this next month. We're excited um, just about the opportunity to gather together um, in an amazing place like Church of the Bar and talk about what you're doing in our lives and talk about and, and dream about what you want to continue to do, not only this year, uh, but as we move forward in the future. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.